Hey guys, welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, and it is time to wear your sweater. Actually, it's not. It's usually the time where people go out and about and basically wear sweaters when they're not supposed to, which is like late spring, early summer. It's kind of like, I'm kind of like one of those folks who wears a, sw wears a sweater at pretty, pretty much the wrong time and expect the weather to be a lot warmer for this weekend because your high is going to be 64 degrees outside, your low is going to be 43. Uh, Saturday is going to be pretty much the same thing, but of course you have that 40% chance of rain that's happening with that 20% chance of thunderstorms and isolated sun thunderstorms happening for Sunday with your high of 71 degrees. And then Monday, it's supposed to get to 74 degrees. So that's a little look at your weather for this weekend. So if you guys are planning on being out and about, you may need to, need to, need to wear a light uh, spring jacket. Um, just to kind of take off and on and all that stuff and maybe just like a really undersized umbrella that you can just kind of stick somewhere Maybe a purse or maybe like a pocket or whatever. Uh, so yeah, that's basically your uh, quick little weather look at of what's going on um, if you uh, So I'm gonna have, I have a lot to talk about today So I'm gonna kind of try to rush through it as much as possible. I got news I got like three city council items where they're gonna talk about uh, The growth and how Missoula is gonna grow inwards is kind of what they're concentrating on and working on high-density uh, areas. And I think one of the quotes that I will share with you is that they're trying to have about 23 dwelling units in an acre spot in the inner city Missoula area. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the show. They're talking about urban forestry and then they're also talking about closing a bike lane that usually is swamped with uh, parking. People have been parking in, the, in a bike lane up on the in a couple of the areas where there are parks. So I'll talk a little bit more about that about how the city is co um, combating all the uh, um, parking that's uh, disrupting the bike lanes. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. I got dubbing stuff. I got pre-critic. I got all sorts of wonderful stuff for you guys today on the show. But let's kick it off with a little thing that's happening here in Missoula. And by a little thing, I mean um, people are going to definitely feel the burn um, this weekend at the Adam Center Fieldhouse as Bernie Sanders is coming to Missoula, Montana from, 12, from 11 to 12 p.m. Um, he's going to be talking about Rob Quist, and he's going to be rallying a couple places in and around the Missoula area, so you guys can check it out and see what's all going on with that. Uh, Quist told the uh, Great Falls Tribune he wants to show off the grassroots support behind our campaign and share the message that we will need elected leaders fighting for working class families instead of millionaires, corporations, and special interests to Sanders, who will make at least four stops in the campaign over the weekend. So he's going to be in Missoula. He's going to be in um, Bozeman. He's going to be in Billings, and he's going to be in Butte. So he's going to kick it off, uh, I think it's today, and he's going to go to M Missoula and Butte. And I think on Sunday, he'll probably go to Billings and Bozeman. Um, so it's going to be a whole weekend extravaganza thing. And you can find out more information by logging on and to RSVP by going to go.robquist.org. And then, of course, they ha they'll have a bunch of links to this particular page. But here's the quick little website if you want to jot it down. You can always pause the video. It'll be on YouTube. Um, but then you just go. it brings you up to this website, and it shows, oh, look, there's uh, Bernie Sanders. Woohoo! <laughs> I don't want to sound too biased. It's, it's a guy coming down to Missoula to basically tell you to vote for Rob Quist. And that's as much as I'm going to spend on this particular story. In the state, um, I'm going to get completely off of politics because in Montana, a bunch of archaeologists have discovered remains and have discovered um, little, uh, um, basically in a way of saying, uh, I guess, say whispers of people and cultures and ancient cultures in the, uh, um, the Rocky Mountain area in Idaho, Montana, and um, Wyoming. So uh, there's a bunch of archae archaeologists who've been going to uh, national park areas, places that have pretty much been untouched by man in the last like so many centuries, um, and they were discovering little tidbits of little evidence showing that people have been making their own natural pathways, um, ancient pathways of people who were um, roamers and people who would go back and forth. So Larry Todd, archaeologist professor, um, at Colorado State University has conducted surveys in the um, Absaroka Mountains of Wyoming since 2002. In the 15 field seasons, he, his team has had had permission to explore about 650,000 acres of the Shoshone National Forest the agency officials believe was barren to artifacts. Um, a warming climate is also mountain, mount, mountain ice patches. As, uh, as they receive, they are revealing um, uh, 
organic artifacts, uh, including arrow shafts, bighorn sheep skulls, and baskets. Um, the problem also with this is the ice patches are um, receding so fast that researchers can't keep up with all the um, finds on the records of the 10,000 year old artifacts before they are destroyed. So there's kind of like, it's, it, there's a melting and then it remelts. So a lot of times when things are still frozen, it kind of preserves it, but with the constant change in weather, it's like you have a hot skillet of, uh, like a hot skillet that you're constantly pouring cold water over. So that's kind of, uh, kind of what's going on with a lot of the artifacts that are in these particular mountain areas. So I think it's, it's pretty exciting proving that, um, that people did exist and were uh, making things back 10,000 years ago. But, you know, it's because if you look at history, there's a lot of history recorded on the other side of the world. But when it came to like Western culture, there was the, the only basic evident things are usually south of uh, the, the northern Rockies and the United States with, you know, the Incas and the Mayas and all those uh, pyra there. Uh, I, I don't want to call them pyramids, but they're, they're a version of the pyramid. I can't really think of it on the top of my head right now. The temples or whatnot. Um, but uh, they had a lot of uh, things in the mountain mountainous region because usually with a lot of the tribes what they were which they which they continued to do well into the uh, uh early early 18th 17th centuries when they're discovered by the uh i guess you would say the the eastern continental areas when they migrated west uh when they found all these areas and whatnot so that's kind of exciting to f um, find things that are older than most other things, j just as old as most other discoveries that have been discovered all across the world. But China still holds the uh, number one spot as finding the, one of the oldest artifacts in the world with some pottery and stuff. So um, in national news, Donald Trump has made efforts um, after he uh, fired FBI director um, um, James Comey. He, uh, he um, basically put on a, a task force or an a, a action committee, a counsel Robert Mueller. He is a former director of FBI for special counsel for the Russian investigation, with uh, James Comey being fired from the FBI for investigating Trump's ties to Russia, and now another person doing um, what Comey was doing. I mean, I, it's definitely confusing. It's interesting. It's like you fire somebody, it's like, oh, I'm investigating you because you might be, because Russia might have uh, affected the election. It's like, oh, okay, well, you're fired. And then people are just like, you probably shouldn't have fired him. It's like, oh, oh okay, then I'll hire someone else to do his same job. It's like, oh, okay. So he hired this person, uh, Robert Mueller, which actually both sides of the Republicans and Democrats are just like, oh, great, perfect. We're going to find out what's really going on. So that's kind of what a lot of both sides are saying. Uh, the, bra the background was that Trump's campaign had Russia tie Russian ties, and there may have been some issues with the election results, which is now being investigated. Mueller will have more authority to prosecute any involvement the, in the Trump campaign than had the former uh, FBI director James Comey would have um, is what they're saying. Um, so both sides are in agreement on the Capitol Hill as they agreed that Mueller was the best choice for this investigation. So we'll find out what really happened and um, determine whether or not Trump had Russian ties or not. He seems like he's fairly open about uh, what's going on over uh, the election and everything. So we'll find out a little bit more later on. Um, I got a bunch of new programs on MCAT tonight. We're going to kick it off with a little uh, for um, the Missoula County Spelling Bee, but then there's a whole bunch of other things on MCAT. And then, I'll, and then we'll come back and we'll do some pre-critic. Nosiest. The interviewer has the reputation of daring to ask the nosiest questions. Uh, Most prying or inquisitive? Um, uh, what's the organ? This word consists of an originally English element plus English combining forms. Nosiest. N O S E. I E S T. Nosius. Thank you so much, and I need all of you to come to Jessica right there and fill out paperwork. And a few, oh, wait, we have some medals that I need to give out, right? Are those still in the hallway? Oh, hang on just a moment. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn, 
long after they are gone. And so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common trudge. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men uh, count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a lawyer, my son. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if I, how long did I go, Paul? I, I didn't. Uh, yeah, we, we have it until five. You got 15 minutes. Oh, I, he said 45 minutes, so that was great. So, are there any questions or comments? I've got a very thick skin, so fire away. <laughs> <laughs> Memories of childhood linger in Missoula before the interstate cut its way through Blackfoot Canyon across the face of the Bagrino Mansion. We would go to the woods to gather berries and mushrooms, wade in the beaver ponds and harvest watercress. Yes, we were better fishermen when we were 12. <laughs> but I understand now we can grow and have hope in my hometown for the dirt. It's good there. You can fall in love in Missoula. Just look and listen. Witness the metamorphosis. Young people with no dirt under their nails yet, with dreams, reinventing themselves, connecting with passionate work, committed to imaginings of what could be here. One can fall even more deeply in love here. No one makes fun of you because of your dream in my hometown, for the dirt is good there. No one makes fun of you for your dream in my hometown. For the dirt, it's good there. Thank you very much. Here is a little annotated constitution, which all of the Bundys carry, all of the militia and all the Bundys carry a constitution in their pocket. Um, if you ask them, they ask it why you don't have your gun on you. You say, well, I don't have a concealed carry permit that's recognized in Oregon. This is a conversation I got into. And they all pull out their constitutions and say, this is the only carry permit you're going to need. And uh, I, I said, well, I don't know if the sheriff would agree with that. And Dave Ward is pretty, uh, you know, pretty big guy. I, don't, I, I decided not to bring my guns. So. Uh, <laughs> Cleon Skousen was also the founder of the John Birch Society. And in my day, as a child, people began to make fun of the John Birch Society because they had, he, he, they believed that fluoride in the water was like um, poisoning the minds of American teenagers and making them be hippies or, I can't remember, but it was a, it was a very interesting thing. Um, and, and Cleon Skousen actually plays a part in the movie Dr. Strangelove. Um, so uh, he's a very, it's, it's amazing that this uh, interesting gentleman should have echoed into 2017 and the debate over public lands. Hey guys, welcome back. And now it's time for a little thing called Pre-Critic. If you haven't um, heard about this movie that's coming out, it's uh, another attempt at Ridley Scott going back into the Alien franchise. Um, his uh, first reboot uh, prequel whatever movie was called uh, Prometheus and now he's going on with uh, Alien Covenant um, from yet another attempt to capture the hearts and minds of the young filmmakers comes really Scott's second time at rebooting the Alien franchise. Alien Covenant follows a uh, large group of colonists on their way to a planet that can sustain life. But hold the phone, scratch. <laughs> the planet seems to be the wrong kind of life. Um, watch as Ridley Scott, who believes any alien life in outer space will automatically kill all human life, proves that humans stand no chance against an alien contagion with teeth. Um, I'm in it for the sci-fi, uh, but don't expect anything different from the last few alien movies. Everybody dies, basically, but uh, the main characters, maybe one or two. Who knows? Maybe the robot lives. Who cares? Uh, moving on to the next thing. Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Speaking of unnecessary reboots, comes a film that follows a kid, a wimpy kid, as he navigates school's 
social hierarchy. Let me see Game of Thrones writers write one of these movies because with a show, movie or show, death or jail is final. Kind of like with Game of Thrones is like what they do is with the characters like oh let's kill them. But you know like when you live in the real world like nowadays, um, you you deal with a social hierarchy that's just like oh you can't just get rid of someone nowadays. You have to actually work with them and find a solution. Um, so I think these these kind of movies are good when it comes to kids trying to find ways and find to navigate through their schools. I don't know why I'm actually for this kind of movie, but um, it's but you're gonna see a bunch of stupid jokes and a bunch of stupid things but basically it's a whole rebooted cast uh, from the original it's the fourth i think it's the fourth of a franchise based on a book series written by a guy um so it's a whole crappy movie based on a bunch of book series that it's all about family and making fun of the weird kid like that's basically what i got from a lot of the trailers and some of the movies that i've kind of half got along the way anyways um, speaking of a kind of like a rear window, but not re really a rear window type movie comes, Brian Cranston stars in this uh, title character um, in overreaching movie. Uh, basically, it's an overreaching movie about a man who cannot function in what we consider normal society. Um, Wakefield basically is about a man who becomes homeless because he had a mental breakdown. Um, he watches his old life from um, afar from an attic window. He basically looks and he sees how his his life and his kids and his family kind of operate without him, and he kind of does his own life. And I don't know if I'm like prejudging this movie, hence the pre-critic uh, title of this segment of my show. Uh, but anyways, Brian Cranston is a good actor, and why not watch a drama? But of course, since it's not during the um, the Oscar season, this is pretty much going to be a very expensive lifetime original movie. And that concludes. Pre-critic, I have uh, another movie that I've uh, redubbed for you guys um, through a, sh um, a segment I like to call dubbing stuff. And when we come back, I'll talk about all the MCAT um, events and all the MCAT news that are going to be happening in the month of May. I got a letter. I got a letter. I got a letter. Oh, did you get a letter? <laughs> That's what I just said. I got a letter. It's great. Look at this letter. It's so great. It's so awesome. Yeah, it's kind of weird that people still send letters nowadays. What is it? And who is it from? I. C. U. P. Oh, that's kind of weird. What do you think it means? Oh, well, aren't letters wonderful? They could be, be sent by anybody. Anybody at all. Yeah, I don't know about that. I will keep reading. Here is my last will and testimony. I bestow upon little girl with most everything that I have in this will. <laughs> Sucker. And furthermore, by giving this person, this is binding legally, and therefore, me, me, me. Interesting. Oh, man. Why am I reading backwards? Anyways. To whom this letter concerns, make sure this little girl gets everything she ever wanted Ah, this is great. I can't wait to get everything that I ever wanted. Mwah! And you always will. Ah, this is great. I can get, like, a ball and a cup. I mean, you get one of those, like, oh, well, what's that sound? Hey, let's go check it out. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, uh, this is weird. Oh, way. Oh, the way. We've got to go. Ay, 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 uh, ay, ay, can ay, this ay, day ay. get any worse? You know, we have to honor our soldiers. We've got to go on. Do I have to honor their singing? Well, if you're a true patriot, are you? Aren't you? Huh? Far be it for me to challenge my patriotism. Oh, I mean, no disrespect, ma'am. It's just that, you know. It's a pretty catchy song. Uh, I don't know about that. You know, catchy songs are usually songs that get stuck in your head, kind of like Hoopa Stank. Uh, Hoopa Stank. Uh, oh, I just realized something. I have to go over here. Uh, uh, oh, wait, wait, hold on a second. Let me just check this letter real quick. Uh, looks like an anagram. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anagrams at all. Do you know? Can you help me with anagrams? <laughs> <laughs> this is very disappointing. Anagrams are fun. You can't just give up at the first look. <laughs> Maybe you're right, but they're just so hard.
And yes, that was Shirley Temple. Anyways, moving on. Um, let's talk about some MCAT news. Uh, this Saturday is our last Saturday drop-in. So um, a lot of last chance to kind of see what the kids have been doing in the 2016-2017 season of our Saturday drop-ins. Um, originally, it was more like a Saturday drop-in animation, but a lot of times the kids like doing some live action stuff, so we threw a little bit of live action in there. Um, just kind of like it's more of like a creative outlet for kids just to come down and you know explore and just kind of like work with stuff. But tomorrow, it's all going to be about games, watching their movies, and just eating food and just hanging out. So um, I invited some of the more uh, frequent kids to come out there, but it's also open to anybody who is curious and wants to join us for that as well. So that's a little bit of knowing that. Um, um, MCAT will also be at MISCON this year. So uh, de mor de during <laughs> Memorial Day weekend, MCAT will uh, uh, be setting up our VR, our virtual reality uh, Vive station, in which we will basically be there pretty much all week long and invite people to come down and kind of like join MCAT and kind of get an idea of what MCAT's all about which uh, is all about Vive, and there'll be, hopefully we're gonna try doing some like, maybe some live streaming on Twitch, and do some kind of like cool thing, try to get something going on on there as well. So people are more than welcome to come join us um, at MissCon, sign up for MCAT. Uh, MCAT is a great resource for anybody to use. Um, MCAT, if you wanna find out more information, you can go on to MCAT.org, here's their nice little website. I want to thank all the people who support MCAT, who all kind of like come, came down and joined us for our MCAT party. So our uh, 27th birthday party, and also it was mostly a relaunch of our new brand, which is Missoula's Community Media Resource. Um, it's great. Um, MCAT is a great resource where you can watch all local videos um, made and produced here locally in Missoula. Um, farm raised... Um, Farm raised, grown, ranched here, all natural, um, no chemicals, um, all electronic, all um, um, Northwestern energy electronically made, all sorts of wonderful things like that. But you can find out also about my show by logging on to wakeupmissoula.wixsite.com slash wakeupmissoula. Be sure to subscribe, like, and follow on Twitter. Facebook and YouTube, all wonderful sources of where you can find out more information. Um, I do. It, it is Friday, and as always on Fridays, we have our flagship Friday video of the week, and this one is an artsy piece provided by the kids at Washington Middle School. <laughs> Yeah. Or something. Yeah, I don't know. It's really, ah. 
there. We should we should ask him if we can play. Let's go. Alright. Hey, say yes. Hey! Can can we play too? Sure. We're free. If you don't know what that movie was about, me neither. Anyways, moving on, it's time for some city council stuff. Um, we got a bunch of things that are happening um, in and around uh, Missoula and city council. It kind of keeps you updated about what's going on with that. Um, Missoula is having their growth policy. So uh, the many goals and objectives of actions of the growth policy is the planning division is on the front line for preparing the community in readiness of how new development ideas and challenges um, when growth is uh, um, concerned. Um, so the pressures are felt or the community concerns are raised within particular areas of the city. The division considers ways to address the concerns and balance the needs of new development would establish context by introducing new tools to help um, mitigate the challenge and often streamline the process. Uh, Lavelle means spearheads the process in the land use and planning meeting last Wednesday and here is Lavelle means with uh, some PowerPoint slides. The way that we approach long-range planning is we start with data and, and we just feel it's really important to, do, to know information about our community, have a strong foundation and solid groundwork that helps to inform the decisions that we make. So we do put a lot of emphasis on the data and the analysis to help um, you all with the uh, reasons why and decisions that you make going forward. From there we are into um, helping to shape and craft recommendations that come forward to you for policy consideration. Um, policy. All right, so um, that was just kind of like a, a brief little rundown of what they're going to be talking about rest in the rest of the meeting. Uh, the next part, Lavelle continues to give an update on what the process is or what is called Our Missoula, which was originally a grassroots organization that, through the government. Um, it was sponsored by the government, but it was asked that the citizens of Missoula come together and work on this as well. Many of the issues that the city has is uh, the amount of open space and the uh, matter of like residency and dwelling is like to uh, kind of like even it out. You know, like, who doesn't want to have a house with a backyard? People, like, are used to having houses with a backyard, but with high-density dwelling units, the yard gets smaller while the uh, the amount of people will get larger and larger. And that's kind of what the city's kind of working on, trying to figure out ways to be like, okay, let's have high-density th areas, and then we also have some open space areas to help even it out. So there's uh, the ability um, to create... Um, uh, better areas for people to live in, but also be able to easily go to a place where they can have open space. So it's all about Alba Room, baby. Um, so the ability to create, so one of the things that they talked about is that um, acreage uh, to create 23 dwelling units per acre, which is already the max capacity for most areas. Julie Armstrong um, asked some questions, um, and this is, and Lavelle means answers them. So here is uh, Julie Armstrong on the city council. We starting to kind of plan for an aging population and looking at how our development and will will accommodate special needs and special accessibility requests and zero degree entries and things like that. And then the other question I had is we don't have an HPO right now. Is that something that is that what the extra FTE is for is to put that position back into play or is that going to be integrated into everybody else's positions? Sure. Um, we filled the HPO position and, and that FTE has been retained so there's no change to that status. Uh, she started last Thursday. Name is Emily Schurer. Um, regarding your questions about the aging population, yeah, that is something that we are, are very much um, uh, cognizant of and, and I think interfaces with the 
housing aspects and preparedness there, um, healthy built environment needs, um, the relationship to transportation and services. So I think it's going to carry through on many different um, places and aspects that we work on in the city. All right. So. Um that it's it's interesting how like you know when in terms of like growth policy you're always asked it's just like you know you know what would be a good idea this but wait 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 and then there's another question that comes up like what about these folks and these people is this gonna basically accommodate their needs so that's kind of like what this a lot of these policies are about trying to figure out what is this and that um because Missoula is definitely kind of like the place where a lot of people go to retire um a lot of people come here to work but there's also a lot of issues when people come here they want to find an ability to like have a sustainable job but to have a sustainable job is to have a sustainable home so that's kind of like one of the things that the city of Missoula is definitely go going into um um, Julie talks more about the design review for these high density dwelling units. So um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, high density. So this is uh, Julie Armstrong um, on the uh, high density question. Last couple of weeks about all these lovely things we'd like to do, we really need to set housing policy first before we can proceed. So is that something you see as part of your duties? I think we were going to be part of the team, and I think, it, you know, I believe it would be led by uh, the housing division, but we bring so much to the table in terms of the, the, the growth policy, the, the research that we do, and the data that we have, that we would be an integral part of the team. All right, so uh, that was uh, Lavelle Mean saying that um, it's not just a, um, a one-person effort or one person saying this is how it should be, this is how it's going to work. It's also going to be a process that a lot of people who are going to be working towards um, developing the uh, smaller neighborhoods or high-density areas as well. That's just kind of like a little overview. Uh, the neighborhood plan process will be used as a template for growing a smart population while still having people have their say in how the city grows because um, this is was all an open public planning committee um, to this certain point and now it's like people uh, basically kind of show like what their desires what their what they want and now we're now the city's trying to reflect it realistically to help um, work with the city and how they grow so it's all about in growth um, so Lavelle means um, she talks about what we can do to move forward and this is Lavelle it's not the um, year and a half, two year process, but I, I think there's still some process to it. It might be how do we um, clarify our implementation steps and, and, and do more there, as well as that review of what we know about our community. And then it needs to still go through the channels as well, planning board and back to you guys. So it sort of stops us in terms of how much more we can carry over without an additional FTE. Um, then I would just add, uh, you know, we're hoping even with that that we can um, be able to start looking at the uh, a comprehensive understanding of uh, infill standards and um, some other cleanup tasks that I have, like trying to move the older, the PUDs that we have and special districts that we have that still refer us back to Title 19, migrating that over to Title 20. All so right, so um, one of the things that uh, Lavelle Means also kind of talked about uh, and what we have actually talked about on, the sh on this show a couple times is that um, in, in terms of high density of dwelling areas is that uh, the biggest thing is that if you, uh, the north side of Missoula, across the tracks, the bad side of town, uh, <laughs> they're working on uh, kind of like an urban redevelopment kind of area trying to work out commercial residential trying to figure out ways to make that a little more accessible but also at the same time make it a little more high high density dwelling open space Tr basically north side is the uh, i don't want to say this but it's basically clear it's like the north side is the guinea pig for the growth inward policy for the city of missoula and so the north side is definitely being highly looked at and trying to improve the infrastructure to help develop the area, also including a nice little roundabout that has an, a highway coming off of I-90 as well. So that basically concludes the land use and planning meeting. They're going to be talking about it, but I think the highlight of this um, particular meeting was all about they need more data and they need to figure out what they're going to use the data for and finding the right data for that fits in with uh, the high density dwelling, but also keeping it up pace with the open space bond that was passed in 2004 to help encourage people to have more open space. Um, so public works, um, stripping was done last year as part of the uh, complete streets policy. After almost one year, the neighborhood and neighborhood councils have expressed concern about bike lanes and wish to have them removed until further notice, especially in the Linda Vista areas. And it, 
Annalise Hedal spearheaded this discussion item, and this is what she had to say. There was quite a bit of comment last year when it was first done, and I actually thought that it would kind of quiet down a little bit. And as you have all seen, I forwarded multiple emails from you, probably, I would say, upwards of 20-plus emails in reference to people's issues with the bike lanes and um, the problem with people parking in bike lanes and the fact that there are two very highly used parks in that area that require quite a bit of parking and activity. Um, it's kind of become somewhat of a safety issue as a result um, as far as people parking on sidewalks and c parking in bike lanes and making it in really tight to drive, etc. So um, I wanted to have a conversation about this um, just because it doesn't seem to, um, the sentiments seem to continue forward that people in my ward would like them removed. So um, that being said, that's, that's what we're going to start it off with and then um, that's it. Thanks. All right. So. Uh, um the next part uh, of this little thing is that they talked about they get showed some pictures and some slides. Um, cars are biking on the uh, cars are um, parking on those bike lanes. Um, bike lanes are great, but when you can't use them, the bikers tend to use streets or sidewalks. And uh, of course, you know, lots of bikers already use the sidewalk. Stop using the sidewalk, bikers. Sorry, that's too personal. But <laughs> Ben Weiss from the uh, Bike Ped Board uh, presents a slideshow talking, to, and he's also with uh, Missoula in Motion. Um, he t does a slideshow and talk about this and many other alternatives to this problem. And he also is joined by Kevin from MDT, uh, who talk about the Mary Street and the other uh, park issues and the bike lanes as well. Is, is this is essentially by the um, park, Maryland Park, that has a uh, splash deck for kids. And it, it's very popular in the summer, in fact. Um, I know that because I frequently use it with my kids. Um, but what you see there is the double yellow in the middle, double yellow center line, and then a fog line that's painted 10 feet away from that. So, so previously, traffic services had, um, previous to this, when this was actually striped in the picture, had been receiving complaints that there was some safety issues that were associated with cars driving too fast. Again, Ben mentioned 32 and a half miles an hour is the 85th percentile speed that's a little fast for a 25 mile an hour road. Um, we decided as one of those safety measures to help slow cars down was to paint that fog line on either side of the road to, to have that lane feel constricted and and hopefully slow cars down so that was All right, so that was um, one of their uh, solutions to this issue is just to kind of also slow down traffic uh, people park in those particular lanes but also at the same time that especially linda vista if you haven't driven through linda vista it's like you're encouraged to drive faster i don't know what it is it's like i've driven down that lane i'm just like i feel like i need to drive fast <laughs> so um, the presentation talks about many other ideas that have similar issues along with guidelines julie armstrong disagrees with some of these solutions that bike ped uh, suggests so this is how she responds to um, ben weiss and kevin the neighborhood is unique the grade on that road for a large portion of it is seven percent and people are simply not riding their bikes up and down that road on a normal basis there's no transit in this neighborhood there are no bus stops people are not riding the bus in and then and taking their bikes with them this road is not usable five months out of the year with the bike lanes the way they're set up now because of plowing and then after that debris in the bike lanes and at the neighborhood meetings a gentleman who rides over 150 miles a week said that he would absolutely not use the bike lanes because of the debris and um, he said they're far more dangerous for him most of the parents their kids are riding on sidewalks on their bikes and not in the bike lanes as it is and I respectfully disagree when you say that the, the parking is not an issue. It is the number one issue. People use Maryland Park all summer long, and then they use the sledding hills all winter long, especially in, in front of the mailboxes. So putting the bike lanes there and taking away the parking is not working at all for that neighborhood. There are three parks along that side where all the parking is gone now. And um, now we've got parking in front of residences that weren't there before. Those folks are upset because you've pushed the parking further up to their houses and they can't park in front of their houses anymore. So I, I really think the Sharrows is the way to go. Um, it would be different if this wasn't a massive hill. It would be different if people had not been parking in front of those three parks for years and years and now they can't. So I, I, 
I, I love the alternatives. I think the, the parking has to come back on both sides. Maybe the option where you showed the Shero going going down and a dedicated bike lane going up, that might be an option, but I I have to disagree. We've That's my award, and I hear from those people constantly. When I have an avid cyclist telling me that the bike lanes are too dangerous for him to use, the way that they're newly striped, that rings a bell for me. All right, so uh, that was um, many of the problems that have been brought up with the uh, Linda Vista area and whatnot. Um, uh, um, let's see. Ben Weiss does respond to some of these issues as well. So um, let's see here. I think, yep, here's Ben Weiss talking a little bit more about this. Park. Yeah. So uh, I'm just trying to get a handle on So what is the problem and what is the we more paramount problem? Is it speeding or is it parking? We didn't think there was a parking shortage, which is why we had no problem removing parking from the other side because there's so much park frontage there to fit a lot of vehicles. And it's a neighborhood park, so park specifically doesn't design them for parking cars because they expect families to walk and bike to the parks. All right, so that was uh, Ben Weiss's response. Um, a lot of times uh, with a lot of popular parks is that a lot of times is that um, people go to these parks who are actually not directly in the area to actually uh, walk to these parks, so people actually go there year-round as well. So. Um, this was an introductory problem in the main streets. There, there's no action item uh, in this particular piece for the um, this, this partic in this meeting. So uh, this is going to be through public works. They're going to be discussing it, and they're going to figure out what they're going to do with moving forward. Um, and this is, uh, but you know, of course, uh, more people finding places to recreate beyond their backyards. That's the thing. Is that a lot of people go to a lot of parks. Uh, based on popularity and that's a lot of that's encouraged by the parks and recreation but a lot of times it kind of falls short when you can't find you, when you can, you can get there but you can't basically stay there it's it's weird like that so up next um, we're talking about a little thing that's kind of adjacent to parks and that's the urban forest so in urban forestry and the parks and Conversa conservation meeting they had an uh, annual update this is a, basically a two-year plan about um, the urban forestry Chris uh, Boza um, talks about the urban forestry, and he's joined with Karen Zippy. I have a quote from Karen Zippy later in this segment, but on April 20th, 2015, the Missoula County adopted this um, City of Missoula Urban Forestry Management Plan, the year, to year the two-year update discussing the process of implementing the uh, strategies listed on in the management plan. There are 26,757 trees in Missoula um, that are um, under this urban forestry. Um, Chris Boza reviews the urban forestry plan and hopes to help people prune and remove trees uh, appropriately. So this is um, Chris Boza. Uh, we have 2,339 trees in very poor condition or less, and that's down 29% from last year. So we are making inroads in managing the uh, trees that pose the highest risk to our urban forest. And of those, three, uh, 318 are dead, and that's down 75% from 2014. So we've been taking a very active role in getting rid of the uh, trees that are dead and then also the very poor. So um, one of the key things, and I, I want to bring this up, and, and that is that the city staff, uh, the forestry staff, is qualified to make tree risk assessments. We have the advanced tools, such as the tomograph and the resistograph, and we have the knowledge base to use those tools. However, when we get the information provided by those tools, we default to the worst case scenario. And uh, again, since the, the city does not have a risk manager, we oftentimes have to uh, wear two hats of both uh, the uh, folks who are doing the assessments on the trees and then also looking at the risk and what the risk is to the city as a whole. All right, so uh, again, that was Chris Boza kind of talking about the urban tree uh, issue and some of the things that are happening and things that are being done. It seems like 75% of the dead trees have been removed since 2014, which is great. Um, uh, with all the trees that are in Missoula area, the citizens are encouraged to report any trees in their right-of-way areas. Basically, these right of tree ways it's kind of like a whole different rule about how the urban trees kind of interact with your house so if you bought a house and your trees kind of like 
in near the more of the sidewalk kind of region. Those are technically the urban forestry under the ur urban forestry division, and they kind of work with that. But also the um, a lot of things about the urban forestry was made to actually be even uh, less of a liability in terms of the city um, and making it more of a thing that people at home have to work with as well. Kind of like, you know, you, you have to clear your sidewalks or you get fined because they're public right away. Then hence that a lot of the trees that are kind of there, they're kind of an issue that you have to deal with. If they're dead, if you have a dead tree and be like, oh, great, I have a dead tree. Um, I should probably call someone. I don't know if I should, you know, like spend that kind of money. They have options out there for people who don't want to uh, spend money, uh, don't want to uh, deal with it in a lot of ways so they can um, call and email the uh, urban forestry folks to kind of say, hey, could you get rid of this? And I'll tell you guys a little bit more about that later in the show. But let, let's get back to this. I have a um, quote from Karen Zippy, who actually talked about a lot of the volunteers that actually go out, prune a lot of the trees, and also take out a lot of the dead trees, along with planting brand new trees to kind of help replace them. So here's Karen Zippy talking about some of the volunteer programs that the urban forestry uh, helped um, develop. Part of this is I had a lot of volunteers who wanted to plant trees. And planting trees in public right of way is not easy because you have to have a tree of a certain size. You can't just put a seedling in. Um, they have uh, liabilities. We have um, issues of vandalism, things like that. You can have a car run over them quite easily. So you need to have a tree that's east, at least an inch and a half in diameter, which then requires either a large container or a ball and burlap. And so that's, that's hard to dig a hole in Missoula that big to do it appropriately and get the tree in uh, the right way. So we're trying bare root plantings with my volunteers. We have no root ball. It's not heavy. Our number one concern is making sure that those roots, those fibrous roots, don't dry out before we get them in the ground. Um, so we were able to pull these 60 trees out of the gravel bed between mid-September and mid-October last year. And we took about, oh, I don't know, five to ten trees at any given time. And we loaded them into a trailer with a bunch of mulch. We went to our locations. Um, Chris gave us all lessons on how to plant trees appropriately. But we were able to lift the trees. And they were all of the right size. They were all an inch and a half or greater, but without the huge root ball or without the big container, the heavy big container that you have to deal with. All right. So... Um Successfully, the city of Missoula was able to plant. Um, uh, let me just double check. Um, oh, never mind. Uh, like uh, they planted a lot of trees, basically, and um, only uh, fr from what she what, from what she said and what the tree planting process um, happened. Only one tree didn't make it during the planting season, which is actually fairly rare when it comes to volunteer-based planting because the national average is about 85% of trees that are planted by volunteers die, which is insane. So uh, basically two others did die when the soil couldn't breathe because a couple of the people who planted the trees patted the soil too tight because if, apparently if you pat the soil too tight, uh, the basically air can't get in and the tree suffocates to death. So that's interesting, a little tidbit that you guys should know when planting trees. And a couple others were just uh, destroyed from vandalism as well. So other than that, uh, almost like more than 90% of the trees that were planted were successfully planted. So Chris Boza, um, he talks about the uh, classes they have uh, to offer in the high schools. And I think this is a really cool uh, nice little um, um, little uh, let's see where was I okay here's Chris Boza and he's talking about some of the um, programs that uh, the urban forestry is doing within the schools I've developed a class through uh, the high school Big Sky High School and uh, that was part of the management plan implementation strategy uh, we did a beta class we had eight students they were our guinea pigs uh, we currently have 23 students signed up for 2018 so it's a forestry class, and uh, um, it's it's actually uh, very exciting. And uh, one of the things that I uh, wanted to point out is that uh, when the when, when the high school students drive around streets now, they look at trees completely different, and they see a lot of things, and they go, "Wait a minute, what about that? What about that?" And so 
uh, that's how we slowly begin the process of educating the folks in the community. So I think that's a really uh, – I just kind of want to end the um, this segment on that nice little quote that uh, it's always nice to hear some good news that's happening in the Missoula area. A lot, there are a lot of dead trees, and back in 2014 when they actually imp implemented the uh, Urban Forestry Master Plan, uh, that there it was getting – kind of crazy because I mean like even if a tree dies there's not a, like there's still that chance that they can still basically be rooted and be standing for at least like five or ten years or so um, but there's always that uh, chance that they can always fall and like break a car or break a roof or anything like that so there's so many trees that were removed in the last uh, two years alone um, I think that they reported over about uh, um, 318 trees that re were removed completely and there's over 2,000 trees that are um, dying basically or way past their lifespan on um, uh, for the for their uh, their species average um, so other future perspective programs is the urban forestry hopes to get a gravel pit to grow trees that will make planting trees in your home cheaper and cheaper so a lot of times in this meeting what I learned is that if you buy a tree for two hundred dollars expect planting the tree gonna cost four hundred dollars not overall so the overall it would be six hundred dollars so it's like twice he, Chris Bozer goes on to say is like it's twice the amount of how much the tree costs to plant the tree. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And with the new tree kind of tree planting gravel pit farm that the city is kind of trying to work with, I think they are planning on probably growing trees in the new uh, Missoula Echo Compost Place. I don't know what it's called. I keep on forgetting the name of it, but it's called Missoula Compost. And um, it's it's where the water treatment facility is, the wastewater treatment facility is, and that's kind of what they're doing is using the water and the um, all the overhaul because in that area there's a lot of uh, moisture in the area, so a lot of the trees are being used to help filter water. But that's a whole nother story. That's a whole nother thing. Um, so if you want more information and if you want to uh, have a tree planted or a tree removed from your property because you think it's dying or it's dead, you can email Chris Boza at cboza, C-B-O-Z-A, at ci.missoula.mt.us. ci.missoula.mt.us is a great um, source and website that you guys can get on to find out more information about what's happening in your city and local government. But also, if you want to call him, you can call him at 552 622 Seven zero again. That's five five two six two seven zero. If you want to call them at that, um, they do have a a a pay share uh, a pay share program. So if you want a tree removed faster and right away, you can work out a deal with them to be like, hey, I'll pay X amount of money. Is like, oh great, we will put you on the top of the list to remove that tree. So I have a brand new art clip for you guys. It is from the Clay Studio of Missoula. And when I come back, I'm going to talk about everything you need to know what's happening in and around the Missoula area. And you can check out all those uh, clay exhibits until the end of May. Uh, it ends May 25th, so you don't, you guys don't have too much time to check it out. They'll be uh, ending it next Wednesday, I believe. Um, today is the May 20th. Oh, actually, no, today is May 19th, so actually you have until next Thursday. Sorry, I'm getting all backwards. I'm thinking that today is Saturday, which is not because I'm doing the morning show and I do it every Wednesday, Friday at 
8 a.m. But of course, that will be changing soon because in mid um, June, I'm going to be moving up an hour and we're going to be doing my live morning show from 9 to 10. But you won't really notice because I usually post this online and most people get it from the online source. Um, so let's talk about some things that are happening in the Missoula area with some events. Um, International Bike to Work Day starts today. Whether you bike to work or school, ride to save money or time, pump those pedals to preserve your health and environment, or simply to explore your community, National Bike Month is an opportunity to celebrate the unique power of the bicycle and many reasons we ride the, le the, the League of American Bicyclists. And you can help Missoula by riding to work this month. Um, yeah, it's great. Check it out. It's to kick off Bike Month. Uh, Tiny Tales of the Missoula Public Library uh, for uh, kids' birth to 36 months. Um, this is a unique program held every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 10.30 a.m. Babies ages um, birth to three years of age are invited to attend, and they must be accompanied by an adult lap. Participants will sing songs, learn finger plays, and nursery rhymes, and hear stories. This program is usually held downstairs at the large meeting rooms, and signs will be posted at, if held elsewhere. Um, Girls' Night Out um, is happening tonight. Uh, roll Away Your Pain at the Rue Women's Club. Every Friday, they open the club to public for education in a fun, comforting environment. This month, theme reducing chronic pain, foundation training with Tony Foam, Roller Derby, Roller, why am I thinking roller derby? Sorry, roller therapy by Linda, and this is Friday, 6:30 to 7:30 p.m. Um, today, it's going to be free and open to the public, which is great. Um, S. Brian Wilson, Blood on the Tracks, Shakespeare and Company. Um, after serving in Vietnam, the Vietnam War, S. Brian Wilson became a radical, nonviolent peace protester and pacifist, and this memoir details the drastic governmental and social change he has spent in his life fighting for. Chronolo uh, chronicling um, his personal struggle with the government he believes to be unjust. Wilson sheds light on the various incarnations of protests in the U.S. government, including a refusal to pay taxes, public uh, fasting, and most famously, public obstruction. On September 1st, 1987, Wilson was run over by a U.S. government um, um, train during a, a nonviolent blocking action in which he ex um, expected to be removed from the tracks, providing a full look into the tragic event, Wilson, who lost his legs in the incident, discussed how the uh, subsequent pub publicity propelled his cause towards the national um, consciousness. Um, now, 23 years later, Wilson tells his story of social injustice, nonviolent struggles, and a so-called American way of life, and this is going to be at Shakespeare and Company at 7 p.m. tonight. A cheap date night is going to be the Missoula Public Library at 7 p.m. tonight. Um, you watch a movie and hang out. It's free. A, p a peaceful landscape, Painting with a Twist. Um, it's going to be at Painting with a Twist, and this is going to be uh, 2100 Stevens Avenue, um, number 108 room number 108 and it's the Stevens Center in Missoula so you can check it uh, it's gonna be painting classes they, they're doing a whole bunch of painting classes and it's a new painting experience as well hysteria so if you like contemporary dance hysteria will be performing the last event at the Union Hall um, at 8 p.m. and it's the talented bear bait dance company will be uh, doing all sorts of things when it comes to hysteria dancing and also hopefully invoke some dancing within the community as well that goes to this performance at 8 p.m. and um, it's uh, written by Kelly Borma, B Boma, sorry about that if I botched your name. Um, tonight is the last night to check it out. There's basically nothing else happening downtown. See, there's like two items. It's going to be a union club and top hats and live music, and I'm pretty sure everywhere else is just a bar. Um, and that basically includes everything that's happening for your Friday. Just to remind you, farmer's markets tomorrow. They have an antique toy, sh um, toy uh, show, all sorts of stuff, and miniature show sale at the Ruby's Inn and Conference Center. There's going to be... Uh, Paint with us uh, with painting with a twist. Yeah, family story time at the public library um, at 11. Um, also, you have open house at the Moon Randolph Homestead at 11 a.m. You got RMEF Kids event at 11 a.m. at the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Community open mic uh, lawn party is at 12 p.m. at the Missoula County Courthouse. So if you see a whole bunch of things happening in the downtown Missoula area on Saturday morning, there's a little bunch going on, which kind of explains why there's really nothing going on Friday night because everything's kind of geared towards your Saturday morning. So uh, there's a drop-in tour at the Missoula Art Museum. You guys can check it out at 12. But also come on down to our Saturday drop-in where we'll be premiering all the stop animation movies the kids have made um, this year, 2016-2017 season. Thank you for joining me and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramph. Um, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Mm-hmm.